Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the fourth event of our joint CCA and Universidad Diego Portales series on the proposed Chilean constitution in an international context. We would like to thank Domingo Lovera, head of the public law program at UDP, for his invaluable collaboration on this series. It is my pleasure to introduce our esteemed panelists and our moderator for today's discussion on the provisions related to women's rights and reproductive and sexual health rights. First, we have Rebecca Cook, Professor Emerita and Co-Director of International Reproductive and Sexual Health Law Program at the University of Toronto. Ruth Rubio Marin, Professor of Constitutional Law at the Universidad de Sevilla and Veronica Undurraga, Professor of Law, Universidad Adolfo Ibáñez, will be leading the conversation as moderator. With that, I'd like to invite Veronica, if you would please get the conversation underway. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to thank uh, Marta and Ken Frankel, Marta uh, Blackwell, the Vice President of the Canadian Council for the Americas, and before we were joined by Ken Frankel, the president. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity uh, to share these conversations on women's rights in the Chilean draft constitution with this group of international experts and dear friends also, Rebecca Cook, Ruth Rubio Marin, and uh, Domingo Lovera. Thank you, Universidad de Portales also to make this uh, possible. And, and in, in five minutes, I, I'm going to give some background information on the conditions that made it possible for this draft to constitute a very important advance for global constitutionalism on gender issues. I would like to highlight some elements that in my opinion are relevant uh, to this, to explain this outcome. Uh, first, uh, the strength of the feminist movement in the last decade and the previous work that the um, women's and feminist movements uh, did in preparation uh, to contribute to this constituent project. We had a previous uh, and successful um, constitutional uh, process under uh, Bachelet's uh, government and, and there the feminists were there also discussing about the content that the new constitution would should have on, on gender issues. And uh, regarding the strength of the feminist movement, uh, we had a very, very important, um, especially among the young, a very important um, feminist activism in, in on the streets. And it was a part, it was at the core also of the, of the um, political upheaval of 2011 uh, 19 uh, so so it was very present from from the beginning then i would highlight the extraordinary and very sophisticated strategy that deployed by the women's movement to achieve the modification of the peace agreement and the new constitution which was the political agreement that made possible to reform the current constitution to be able to initiate, to, be, to begin with a constitutional uh, process and to, to, to change the constitution. Our current constitution didn't have provisions to fully change a constitution and, and these provisions were uh, introduced uh, as a reform to the current constitution due to a, a political ag agreement called the peace agreement, uh, the, the, the agreement for Peace and the new constitution, and that agreement didn't have, um, didn't consider um, a paritarian integration of the convention, and so the the feminist movements and, and women's movement displayed a very sophisticated strategy. The the uh, a network of political uh, scientists, uh, women political scientists, were key. Uh, together with other groups and politicians, and uh, it was a, a very um, uh, complete strategy, um, and they they succeed in 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 introducing uh, rules for the electoral system for the convention to make it paritarian. 
And then um, I would highlight the fact that the feminist convention delegates arrived on the opening day of the convention with a proposal for feminist, for rules of procedures with feminist perspective that would ensure their presence and leadership positions in, var in various internal bodies of the convention, and also with a set of substantive proposals for, for gender rules. And the active, the active participation of the feminist movement and women's organizations in public hearings during the convention and in the presentation of what is called the popular initiative for constitutional norms, for example, um, on sexual reproductive rights and on the norms of the right to care. So those norms um, uh, uh, are of course pro it comes from proposals from the feminist con uh, convention members, but also from uh, the women's and feminist uh, movement that that uh, mobilized to have this popular initiative for constitutional norms. By way of mapping the constitutional norms on, on gender in the new in the in the draft of the new constitution, I would highlight that in terms of parity. It establishes a parity democracy that assumes that gender the differentiation, the gender differentiation of the electoral body. In that sense, um, it's, it, it, it doesn't fully follow the representative, um, uh, uh, the, the idea of the representative democracy with an electoral body that is undifferentiated. That, but but here. It's very important, uh, the idea that the electoral body is compounded by, uh, by men and women, uh, and also should include um, gender diversities. And um, also um, the idea that the Constitution integrates as issues of political relevance, those related to care policies. And, um, it, it also includes a conception of substantive equality. Also, it has, of course, a rule of formal equality, but it's, it, it's all over the, the text, uh, the idea uh, that uh, the state have a mandate uh, to, for, uh, for substantive equality based on the promise that the constitution operates in a society that already has a structural inequalities that must be overcome. Democracy is defined in the text as parity uh, democracy. It established parity in the composition of all, co uh, um, um, all collective bodies of the states on autonomous agency, on the, higher, uh, on the higher bodies of the state administration, in the management of state and, and, and semi-public um, um, companies or, or corporations. And also it has a mandate of gender perspective uh, in the exercise of uh, public functions. And for example, in specific spaces like the uh, armed forces, the judiciary, um, in policy for territorial development, and also in the, in the way that rights are understood, the, the, the way that, that rights and especially social rights are um, described in, in the rights provisions um, or normally have a, a, the gender perspective uh, clear uh, on, on, their, on their wording. And finally, um, I would say that this constitution um, considered a very strong, I would say, well, we can discuss that with, uh, with uh, our, our panelists and especially with Rebecca, uh, a very, I would say, progressive uh, provision on, on um, sexual and reproductive rights that takes uh, the um, that covers the autonomy part of the, the autonomy in the dimensions of, of this right, but also the social and, and reproductive justice dimension of, of this of this right. It has a new right of um, the right to to care and the right to be cared for, uh, which is interesting, and that the that the uh, the state has to develop in public, uh, uh, through le legislative uh, policies, the right to be free of violence, of gender violence, and the recognitions of domestic work as um, uh, 
um, even on um, public uh, accounts on them. Uh, uh, and, and, and also, as I said, uh, social and economic rights have been uh, written, the provision as with a specific gender uh, perspective. So that's as a form of, um, I would say, um, mapping on, on, the, uh, on the new uh, uh, provisions regarding gender in the draft of the Chilean constitution. So, the Veronica, yes. Veronica, I ask just two general questions. One sure. concerns what are the constitutional provisions regarding international human rights norms? Is oh, there a provision? And the second question I have is regards to Article One, this idea of plurinational, intercultural, and regional um, principles that guide the rule of law. I'm wondering, does that include the idea of moral pluralism? That is the, in, the inability of officials to impose their mor morality on others. So those are two general provision questions I have about the general provisions. Yes, thank you for the question. So yeah, I, I, I actually, I should have uh, referred especially to the incorporation of international human rights law to the new constitution. As you, as you know, um, Chile uh, was in, in that kind um, uh, different from other Latin American countries in the, in the sense that our constitutional court and uh, was kind of reluctant uh, to, and, and, and also the, I would say the, the legal part, I, I don't know, um, the doctrines and, and um, law professors, some of them were kind of reluctant to um, incorporate, for example, as a constitutional block the, uh, uh, within the constitution, the, the international human rights law. Well, that has changed in this new draft, um, a constitutional um, human rights law, especially the laws of treaties and, and, and the international custom and, and um, uh, I, uh, is considered uh, part of the of a constitutional block. Uh, it has the same hierarchy than constitutional norms. So, so in that way, um, you, you know that the the, the the consequences is that it expands the the the, the kind of norms that have uh, sub uh, that are. Um, mandatory for the state and for the legislator, including all the international human rights uh, treaties and, and international custom. So, so that's a, also a change in our constitutional uh, landscape. And regarding the second, uh, your second uh, question, uh, well, I, um, this first um, uh, article um, tackles some important pillars of what had what is the the, the foundation of this uh, process it's a uh, there were very strong demands not only for uh, gender parity and gender equality which are um, not reflected especially in this article but they they are reflected in others but also a very strong demands on uh, um, indigenous rights so that's why the idea of plurinationalism, uh, to have different nations within a unitary state, the idea of a decentralized uh, state, which is very important because Chile is an extremely centralized um, um, uh, state, everything happens in, uh, in, in is decided in, in Santiago. And, um, and I would say that uh, there were, important discussions about moral pluralism and, and, and I would say that was resolved on, on the rights provisions on, on a conscience and, relig and religious uh, rights and um, um, it, it considers a moral pluralism and, um, and also on, for example, on uh, freedom of expression and of um, um, uh, educational liberty. So, so I think that I I I don't think that is worrying. And also the all the, for example, the indigenous, uh, also the indigenous rules always have um, as um, 
um, they should be always interpreted within the tradition of, of international human rights law. Thank you. That, that's a very helpful clarification on uh, uh, moral pluralism. So that, that I understand then that the constitutional provisions, the proposals explicitly protect the moral pluralism. That is no one part of society can impose their views on another part of society. And that's not only the secular views, but religious views. Is, yes. is, am, am I understanding correctly? Yes, yes, you are. Yes, you are. Thank you. Yeah. I don't know if Domingo is there. So if you want to step in uh, before um, I begin the dialogue with uh, Rebecca and Ruth. Doesn't seem so. Okay, so um, so well, well um, Rebecca and Ruth received uh, translations of some of the provisions of the constitutions. Uh, maybe uh, those of you who, who are hearing this um, this webinar, some of you have uh, probably uh, uh, read the. Um, uh, the, the draft, and you, so, so you will know that gender provisions are scattered all over the, uh, the different articles of the Constitution, so it was not easy to make uh, um, um, selections of, of different rules, so this may explain that Rebecca and, and Ruth will be asking questions, for example, the, the ones like uh, Rebecca just asked uh, about some other uh, provisions. So, um, uh, so this will be a loose uh, kind of uh, conversation, a, a very open and informal kind of, of conversation, and I will ask um, uh, first, uh, Ruth, you, you you are being following this process from the very beginning, I know, and and also you are one of the the main experts, or maybe the the best, the the most important expert of gender constitutionalism. You are the author of different books, and you are also editing now a new book on gender constitutionalism in Latin America. Uh, so uh, I would like to hear your uh, impressions of what you have read on, on the draft. Yes, Veronica. Buenas tardes a todas y a todos. Um, it is a pleasure to be here on this occasion uh, and, for this, and for this particular purpose, because um, actually, you know, my, my basic reaction is, wow, this would be amazing. Um, you know, it's, it's a celebratory uh, reaction. I, I think that uh, the way uh, the structural um, framing of so many things that you were pointing at from the definition of the whole system as a parody democracy, the foregrounding of substantive equality throughout and not just inserted in the equality uh, clause, the broad understanding of uh, gender as including women, but also gender dissidents and different uh, gender identities and sexualities, the obvious commitment to intersectionality, um, the, the daringness about uh, um, the framing of um, sexual and reproductive rights, the framing of the right to care, all of this is, is, um, is quite innovative. Um, some of this, you can find some glimpses of, of this, you can find in especially new constitutionalism of the region. I would say, um, especially in those uh, constitutional systems that have had uh, undergone uh, amendment uh, or new constitution making experiences over the last uh, 15 years under the influence of human rights norms, but actually also going beyond what human rights norms say in many of these things. But yes, if you take you know, the Ecuadorian or the Bolivian constitution, uh, and if you take some case law from some of these courts, you, you can find glimpses of some of these things. But uh, to my understanding, if this were to pass, it would, be, it would become a leading example for the rest of the world. I don't know that um, any other constitution goes as far in, 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 so many, in so many things. 
Now, as you said, I, I don't have the, the whole text with me. So I, I, I did have questions about uh, some things, you know, like Rebecca, I was asking myself about the hierarchy of norms and how the constitution di enters into dialogue with international human rights norms. And you've answered that. I haven't seen the social rights provision, but I understand that there's been a lot of emphasis on those. And in my understanding, there can be no gender justice without a strong uh, redistributive and pre-distributive dimension. So I would say the most important gender feature of a constitution is, is to have a strong bill of social rights. Um, so I, I understand that you have been discussing that in another session, but I think that is a, an essential uh, element of this uh, conversation. I would assume that the constitution has been drafted with inclusive language, which is also an important uh, symbolic dimension of constitution making through a gendered perspective. I, I haven't read uh, the framing of the anti-discrimination and the equality provision, but I can imagine that it too is, is probably committed to substantive equality with indirect forms of discrimination and intersectional discrimination being taken into account, maybe possibly with a broad scope of a, in a prohibition of public, but also private discrimination. I don't know how far it goes into that direction. You may want to say something about that. I haven't read the freedom of expression provision, Veronica. I don't know whether like the South African constitution to uh, mention an example, it to put some limits to hate speech, including based on gender. Uh, I don't know whether that has been the case. Uh, it would, in my sense, uh, be wonderful if it did. I mean, mind you, uh, we we have to be mindful of the of the you know violations of women's rights that also happen, you know, through social media, through you know just the media sector in general has a more and more is playing a a, a key role in our democratic game, and and so I think it's important to to look at that. Um, I haven't seen how the right to life provision is framed. I assume that you have been very careful about making sure that uh, your very progressive sexual and reproductive rights provision is not then uh, thinned down through some uh, big interpretation of the right to life. I'm, I'm assuming that this is something that hasn't escaped you in doing this. Like Rebecca, um, I was asking myself, uh, because this is not included in what you sent us, um, you know, how the, the strong commitment to multiculturalism or multinationalism is connected to gender equality, and you pointed uh, to that. Um, and I too was wondering whether there's been some, uh, whether there's been some attempt to um, make sure that the proliferation of conscientious objection doesn't uh, create this broad possibility to then, you know, circumvent or bypass everything that's recognized. You know, we recognize these strong equality provisions, these strong uh, sexual and reproductive rights, but then we, le we let people, you know, exercise conscientious objection and then not really abide by the constitutional standards. So I assume that that has been taken into account. Um, I have, mm, Two more um, points, just as a preliminary, you know, first reaction. One is I was wondering how, um, I mean, I personally, I'm very happy with how the text stands in this regard with its commitment to gender parity. But given that you also have a broad acceptance of, um, of sexual um, diversity and, and sexual and gender expressions, I wonder whether there was any, some conversation about, you know, the possible tension between the gender parity project and the gender binary entrenchment. I would be very curious to know how that was negotiated um, in the end, um, because it is presented as if this didn't pose any problem or tension, but in fact, it might. If you say, you know, a parliament has to be 50-50 men and women, then the obvious question is, well, what about people that are non-binary? Uh, so I was curious to know whether that has had been uh, discussed and how um, that had gone. And finally, you you didn't, um, I, I, I notice and celebrate the right to care and be taken care of. 
you don't mention family, you don't mention marriage, uh, you don't mention in the provisions you sent us. Uh, but of course, um, uh, you know, those provisions are deeply gendered provisions. So um, is this because there's no uh, provision referring to marriage or family? Or should we assume that uh, diverse families, same-sex marriage, democratic internally, democratic organizations of families in terms of care, uh, responsibilities and duties, um, you know, has any has any of that been um, flagged out and uh, some kind of new masculinities, new fatherhood um, uh, theories, have they permeated in the, in the crafting of these provisions? So I understand that I'm making, part of it is my reaction, which is a celebratory, and part of it is, is asking you to uh, you know, give us some more information so that we can have a, a broader assessment of what is there and what isn't there. But definitely, as far as I know, this, this strong commitment, very strong and kind of um, commitment to parody, uh, the strong articulation of sexual and reproductive rights, and I know Rebecca will say more about that, and the original crafting of uh, the right to care, not just care as an important social function, which was in other provisions, but actually the right, the fundamental right to care and be taken care of. I think uh, you know are are striking innovations in comparative terms. I will stop here uh, for now. I don't want to eat up all the time. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Domingo. Would you like to step in uh, because you didn't have the opportunity to to speak before? Um, thanks, Veronica. Yes, I have some issues with my laptop, so I switched to the phone. Um, just a quick note on what uh, Ruth was uh, asking. Um, Actually, the, one of the main changes that the proposal is, uh, is offering to, uh, to the people is a change in the kind of state we have. So today we have what uh, has been called a subsidiary state, which means that many of uh, the social goods are provided through private uh, corporations which uh, provide health, education, and of course, is the case of social security in Chile, uh, according to the to the laws of the market, so uh, one of the changes that the proposal is offering is to switch to uh, what is called a social and democratic um, state, so estado social y democrático de de derecho, which may mean which may look as something not that innovative in the in comparative constitutional law, but for Chile, uh, it, it may be a huge a huge change, uh, and in that sense, it's actually. Uh, a constitution, a proposal of a constitution, which is very rich in terms of uh, enshrining social rights, uh, the usual suspects of social rights that we always have uh, discussed about, such as health, social security, uh, education, but also some new additions, at least for our traditions, such as the right to uh, adequate housing, uh, a strong emphasis on the use and uh, of uh, natural resources such as water, and uh, also a strong emphasis on the on on on, on environmental uh, protections and on the rights of the nature, and also some considerations regarding non-human uh, animals. So, just to to uh, answer uh, quickly answer one of the questions that Ruth was posing, and I think it's a very good point. Uh, this is a a, a social rights uh, constitution, and I think actually that's. Along with parity and, and, and along with gender equality, the other uh, key component of this uh, proposal, I don't know if Veronica uh, agrees with me on, on this. I would say that there are, there are uh, these three pillars. Democratic participation, we didn't have till now, I mean, <laughs> if this uh, constitution is, is ratified, we didn't have so, so many um, instances for the people to have a say now we will have uh, popular referendums, popular initiatives of constitutional reforms, uh, popular initiative of legislation and so on and so forth. The second pillar is gender equality and parity. And the third, I would say is uh, social, uh, social rights. Um, 
um, maybe I, I know that Rebecca has to to uh, to leave at eleven. Uh, so so maybe we can hear uh, Rebecca your uh, your thoughts about uh, the general provisions you have uh, read, but but also as we know that you are the an, an expert uh, specifically an expert on on. Um, on sexual reproductive rights, we will we'll like to hear what you and, and health law as well and health rights. Uh, so we'd like to hear uh, what do you think about uh, the draft on those on those issues. Thank you, Veronica, and it's a pleasure to be here. In fact, I don't have to leave it. Uh, I can stay to the end. Let me just put um, these provisions. That is Article sixty one. Article 50, an article on the right to health care, and Article 27 on the right to be free from gender based violence in a broader perspective. You have um, a group of constitutions that are categorized as constitutional nationalism that sustain gender hierarchies, promote patriarchy, and uh, gender discrimination in their provisions. They do it in a variety of different ways, but there are a cluster of constitutional constitutions that can be characterized this way, El Salvador, Poland, Philippines. Slowly, constitutions have moved from constitutional nationalism to constitutional universalism, either in terms of how they're, they're drafted or in terms of how they're, they're interpreted. And one example of this is the Mexican Constitutional Court interpreting reproductive rights in Mexico in 2021, where it specifically said that states constitutions cannot protect life from the moment of conception as that would discriminate against women. Another aspect of constitutional uh, uh, universalism is how courts and how constitutions are drafted to think about international human rights law. And as Veronica said at the outset, this constitutional proposal has strong provisions um, with regard to those treaties, human rights treaties that Chile has ratified. Um, and this is um, to be celebrated in many regards. The other aspect about constitutional uh, universalism is how constitutions are interpreted according to international, in the case of health, health guidance. And this means that, um, for example, the Croatian decision of 2017 on abortion used uh, not, not only comparative constitutional law, international human rights law, but international health guidance. And this is significant because the World Health Organization has just issued this year um, in March, uh, the abortion guidance, which is a very comprehensive guidance that is based on international human rights law. So these provisions that have proposed suggest that Chile is moving towards a constitutional universalism, which is to be celebrated and congratulated. So let me be more specific with regard to these articles on uh, 27, Article 50, and Article 61. Ruth uh, Rubio has very insightfully pointed out that the constitutionalism of reproductive rights usually starts with civil and political rights. That is the right to privacy, as in the case of the US, but that's now been jettisoned the right to security of the person as has the Canadian Constitutional Court interpreted in terms of abortion, as well as the right to liberty. And here I wanna pause. Um, in the concurring decision of Bertha Wilson, Justice Bertha Wilson, she grounded the right to abortion, the right to autonomy and accessing abortion in our liberty rights. But she went even further. She said specifically that the right to liberty includes the right of women to their right of conscience. And that's why I asked Veronica about how this constitution protects the right of conscience. 
The Colombian uh, Constitutional Court this year significantly grounds its decision on uh, decriminalizing abortion in the women's right of conscience. And I'm very sorry that uh, uh, Isabel Yarmillo couldn't join us at the last moment because she is now writing an article on this decision, which I think will explain to those of us who can't speak Spanish, I gather the complete decision is now out, um, how the court does this. But I think how we characterize these civil and political rights, how we bring a gender dimension to these civil and political rights is extremely important. And the right of conscience, the right of women to call their souls their own is extremely important because to date, as Ruth mentioned, we've just been thinking we've characterized the right of conscience as the right of providers to object. And we maybe have overlooked the right of women to call their souls their own. There's a brilliant rewrite of the McGee case in Ireland, a rewrite of the constitutional decision that rejected a woman's right of conscience way back in the 1970s. That's in the rewriting book uh, on Ireland and Northern Ireland. The rewrite is by uh, Mayron Enright and it is absolutely brilliant. And I wonder, had way back that court, which was definitely a court thinking in terms of constitutional nationalism, had they according Mrs. McGee, her right of conscience, where reproductive rights would have been today. So the right to liberty, the right of women to their, their own conscience is very, very important. And the Colombian decision, Bertha Wilson's concurrence in the Morgenthaler decision and um, uh, the rewrite in Ireland is, gives you a basis for thinking about how we could rethink that right. And I'm hoping that this proposal in the Chilean constitution gives us further uh, thinking about how we can use this right to protect women's reproductive rights. The right to integrity, the actual draft 61 in the Chilean constitution really is, goes further than the South African draft, which specifically protects reproductive rights. So as Ruth has said in her scholarship, the constitutionalization starts with civil and political rights that say nothing about reproductive and sexual rights to constitutions that begin to say something about reproductive rights. And the South African constitution is a case in point. It protects uh, reproductive rights based upon the right of integrity of the person. Um, now, the right to integrity of the person might resonate in different ways in different societies, but I mention this because the American Convention on Human Rights has a specific right to integrity of the person that talks about bodily, uh, psychological, and moral integrity. And there is a case going through that is now before the Inter-American Court, the Beatrice case, um, and it will be very interesting to see how the court uses the right to integrity of the person. Now, the right to integrity of the person might think it might be a variation on the right to be free from inhuman and degrading treatment. And this is very significant. We don't have that provision here, but I'm assuming that there is a provision in the Chilean constitution as that is extremely important when it comes uh, to sexual violence and to how Article 27 of the right of uh, women, girls, and adolescents uh, to be free from gender-based violence. Now, other constitutions protect the right to dignity. And this was loud and clear in the Colombian decision of 2006, which called upon um, the country to extend grounds for abortion um, because of women's dignity, their ability not to be used as instruments. But what the, the Chilean constitutional proposals does that goes beyond 
uh, these constitutional interpretations of individual civil and political rights is it grounds the right of sexual and reproductive rights in the right to be free from discrimination. So the, the Article 61 explicitly says that the state guarantees ex its exercise, that is sexual and reproductive rights without discrimination. Now, the ne Nepalese constitutional court, the Brazilian court have used the right to uh, gender non-discrimination as a basis for extending, in the case of Brazil, the grounds of discrimination in Brazil to fatal fetal anomalies. The Nepal and Nepalese Supreme Court has used gender non-discrimination as a way of ensuring that uh, uh, women can access, poor women can access abortion services in their public health care system. But what this Article 61 proposal of the Chilean constitutional draft says explicitly that it guarantees the exercise of sexual and reproductive rights without discrimination. And this sounds in terms of it's a positive obligation of the state. And when you, so finding discrimination, um, the right to non-discrimination is extremely important and also accords with the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, which has been interpreted to, requi to require decriminalization of abortion because to criminalize medical procedures that only women need is a form of discrimination. So the discrimination provision of Article 61 is extremely important. And it's especially important because in the Dobbs decision that overturned Roe v. Wade uh, the, just a few uh, uh, weeks ago, Justice Alito, who wrote the majority of opinion, uh, rejected specifically went out of his way to reject um, the, the possibility that um, advocates in the US could come back on a, an equality ground. He said specifically that pregnancy-based policies are not sex-based discrimination. And this is particularly troubling because in the US, there is a uh, equal rights amendment that is um, that there might be a possibility to amend the US constitution based upon the equal rights amendment. Equality was not before the court, the Dobbs court, but Justice Alito went out of its way, his way to say that an equality based argument would not be entertained by the court. So the Chilean draft really um, in contrast to the conservative trends in the US has a way to lead uh, the world in terms of reproductive rights by basing it on grounds of equality. And this is to be celebrated because to deny women their reproductive rights is a form of gender discrimination is a form of constitutional nationalism, which the US Supreme Court has chosen that path. So finally, one final point about um, Article 61, which really goes even beyond the South African constitutional provisions on reproductive rights. The fact that the last provision guarantees individuals the benefits of scientific progress in order to freely, autonomously, and non-discriminatorily exercise their rights. Again, this is a positive obligation to provide the rights to the benefits of scientific progress. And this would in include contraceptives, um, hormonal contraception, emergency contraception, and of course, the abortion pill. So the, let me end by just these brief overall comments and we can open it to further discussion and debate. But 
the <clears throat> The proposals in Article 61, Article 27, and Article 50 have the possibility of providing a new way of thinking about reproductive rights, for which I congratulate you. Thank you very much, uh, Rebecca. It's so good to hear you framing and um, or, or discussing the Chilean draft uh, within a, a broader uh, framing on um, um, what you call the 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 the, the shift, the shift uh, from constitutional national uh, nationalism to constitutional universalism, and also uh, on um, um, comparing or what we have in in the in the draft with uh, what had been achieved in different uh, uh, countries. Uh, either through in the in the text of the constitutions for example in the south african constitution but also on what courts uh, international courts like the inter-american court of human rights uh, or and uh, constitutional courts for example have understood or, or have or how they have interpreted those those provisions that that is uh, very interesting i want to take some points uh, of what uh, ruth said and answer some of her questions although i don't want to take much time so i will be very brief because i want to hear you yeah we have a provision uh, recognizing recognizing different forms of family uh, so we we have that and also and um a principle of um, of um, um, uh, how do you call the of, of corresponsibility uh, uh, among um, men and women for uh, for uh, the the care of of the family members. We also have a an important uh, provisions, uh, especially on the rights uh, of children and, and and elderly people as well, which I think are um, where we, uh, the constitution members were very uh, aware that these provisions were also drafted with a gender um, and, uh, and and care perspective uh, so so I, and 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 a substantive equality perspective uh, so i think that that it's um that it's also um progress the the provision on on liber um, on liberty of, of freedom of expression it's finally there was a huge discussion on that uh because there were many especially uh, um, i would say conventional members from the left and who wanted to put a lot of the, um, I would say, um, a, a lot of, um, um, uh, not obstacles, but um, uh, limits on limits of expressions. Uh, and and in, in that sense, there was a huge discussion because it was those limits that were proposed could be, uh, it, there was a risk that they could be interpreted in a kind of authoritarian way. So finally, they they decided and we, we had to, uh, they had to approve a, every provision by two thirds of the convention members. So it was a very high, um, uh, it was a very high, high uh, number of votes that they needed. So finally, they, um, what was uh, um, what was approved was a very traditional um, um, a provision on on um, uh, freedom of expression, and I would say that that provision has to be interpreted systematically with the, the with um, the provisions on um, gender against gender violence and on substantive e equality. So, from my point of view, I'm. Uh, I'm kind of glad that we didn't put so many, um, um, uh, so uh, so uh, we we didn't uh, qualify the right to uh, to uh, freedom of expression because the proposals were a little um, extreme in my sense, or or were in the in the context of of. Uh, uh, constitutional authoritarianism that we have a trend on that as well that they, they could be um, uh, used in a problematic way um, uh, regarding it uh, you have a very interesting question regarding how we we 
managed with a very strict uh, and um, parity rule. What what was uh, if there was some tensions with um, with uh, uh, other gender um, uh, 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 of of gender um, dissidents or or of of, um, of gender minorities? Well, I, I would say that um, the 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 congregation, the convention members were in general very young. So they and the feminists were very young. And so they they had, I would say, they were very open uh, to speak uh, about parity and gender stems. And they were very uh, conscious of that 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 um, that um, parity should not. Oh, it should not uh, block or should not be an obstacle uh, for um, a real gender inclusion in a in a more broader way. And so they, I would say that they even risk as as a, 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 a at a moment the gender parity rules on electoral system just to um, try to introduce a more a stronger provisions on gender part, uh, of participation uh, of, uh, uh, of 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 gender uh, dissidents or, or gender minorities. So, um, but at, at, at the end, they they decided to keep the, the parity rule. And I would say that all the other uh, groups are, are treated, uh, are, the, the mechanism is affirmative action for them. And, and it's not, they, they are not considered part of the, of the parity rule, but the parity rule um, lives together with, a, with a, a affirmative, uh, when affirmative actions for these groups that are considered that had been historically uh, subordinated as well. And, um, and what, um, um, Regarding the right of conscious, uh, if you if you see Article um, sixty one, uh, Rebecca, um, and I think that the wording there saying that uh, women can um, um, exercise their right without interference of third people, I think that 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 is um, that was uh, it, it meant. Um, and to uh, to put a kind of um, limit to the exercise of, of conscientious of, of objection that will um, constitute an undue burden to to women. But as you know, we have a very strong uh, conscientious objection right right now, an uh, institutional conscientious objection. So I think that of course the all the the interpretation of this very progressive rule on on, on um, Sexual and reproductive right. We'll we'll see how long we 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 can go with with that, with a new court if we if uh, uh, and with um, I don't know uh, things don't change only because you change the you change the text of a constitution that it helps but but of course we we have a, a strong culture um, protecting um, uh, a conscientious objection. But I would say that we. Uh, for the first time, we have in our constitution provisions on um, um, on uh, personal autonomy uh, that are very strong, um, and I think that that will be very helpful for uh, for for women as well. Um, um, Marta or Domingo, if you receive some questions from, please tell me because I, I'm not receiving the questions from the public. So, so you can tell me if we have one to give um, to give them space. If not, I will ask some questions. Can I just ask something, Veronica, if I may? Uh, because one of the problems that we have, uh, well, in the last months, but also in the month ahead, uh, is the misinformation about what the constitution is proposing. And one of the problems that we have had specifically regarding uh, the, the Article 61 is that those who oppose uh, the proposal, uh, mainly conservative groups, are uh, distributing leaflets saying that uh, women will have the right to abort up to nine months without any kind of restriction or regulation or limitation. Now, I have my own take on this specifically when I take a look at section three of article 61, 
but also these kind of practices take place not only in our own tradition, but also in a comparative perspective tradition. So I, I would love to hear what you have to say, Ruth and Rebecca, about this, this idea that women will uh, have the right to freely abort up to nine months uh, with the law being not able to pose any single kind of regulation, which to me seems kind of um, impossible to reconcile with all the constitutional tradition of this part of the world. But this is what this is the kind uh, this is the kind of inf misinformation that we are dealing with. And actually, this is the kind of information that you see reproducing the big media. Uh, and sometimes this is what is stuck in in, in the people's head. Well, I, I think that. I mean, the first thing to say is that misinformation is probably one of the biggest threats that uh, reproductive rights encounter, uh, you know, this day. So this is why, whereas I understand the concern about introducing many limits um, in freedom of expression, I think there's many ways in which freedom of expression is being used in ways that are terribly harmful for women. So I don't know how we will navigate this, but it's a messy area. Um, I, I did ask you about how, whether the right to life uh, had been framed, because of course, you know that in, in many constitutional traditions where the right to reproductive autonomy has been, you know, built through interpretation, whether it be on autonomy or dignity grounds, you know, the synthesis has been that um, even when the constitution doesn't mention unborn life, you know, life uh, and human life has often been subsumed as uh, something to be protected constitutionally. So often what you have found is this kind of, you know, proportionality analysis or balancing analysis where, um, the right, the reproductive autonomy of women is counterbalanced with some notion of state interest in protecting unborn um, human life. So to me, this is this, you know, it's 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 very interesting because often the debate about not enshrining in the constitution, uh, you know, the protection of unborn life is that it will automatically decide that, you know, the abortion question was that is in fact not the case because you do have these two considerations. So the fact that the constitution recognizes the uh, reproductive autonomy doesn't per se say whether the constitutional court uh, will be willing, I don't know, I guess you will need to answer about the right to life. I haven't read the provision, but even if it isn't spelled out, so many courts in the world have read it into the constitution. So, you know, it will, I think, I suspect in the end, some balancing approach is, is much more likely to be, you know, what, what happens in Chile, even if this provision is, is uh, approved as it is. One, one quick thing that Rebecca didn't uh, underscore, um, and, um, and, and, and if I may also some reaction to what Rebecca said, um, in for the sake of because it's it's you know it's so big what we have in front of us it's you know we're giving one section you know women and the constitution but in fact it's everything right um so um one thing that i think is really interesting is the right to sexuality which is also very very innovative and i think you know it's it's also theoretically very important because once you recognize that abstinence or the duty of abstinence, you know, is in contradiction with a person's right to sexuality, then you have to assume that there is a risk of pregnancy and that no matter how much you control for the possibility of pregnancy, there still is a risk that comes with, you know, sexuality. So I think that the affirmation of that is important. And in fact, in the, in the German constitutional court decision, uh, the dissent uh, of the second uh, constitution, German, uh, German constitutional court decision in 92 draws that distinction between wanting sexuality and wanting reproduction and says you may want you know, to have se sexual relations without wanting reproduction. 
and it links it to autonomy because there wasn't a right to sexuality. But now that you actually have articulated it, I think you know that there's a much stronger base. Um, on my reaction to Rebecca, um, I, I totally see um, the point of the right to one's own conscience. Um, but I, I have to say I was very relieved when the second part of your narrative foregrounded equality versus conscience. Uh, I mean, I would definitely use, I would reframe the conscience argument if I am confronted to all these expressions of conscientious objection, but I wouldn't foreground my big, you know, reproductive autonomy case on conscience, just because I think it's much more likely to be hijacked um, and put into religious terms. I would much rather want this equality autonomy synthesis rather than, I don't know whether you agree on that, but I think you might because of in the end, you, you foregrounded equality. I, I don't know whether your reading of the provision of the Chilean provision is a bit, um, is, is a bit, um, I think what, what the Chilean constitution does is it says, it does mention non-discrimination, but the way I read it in my knowledge of Spanish, is that it says the right it is recognized and it in its delivery and its recognition, there cannot be discrimination, right? So it's not so much that the right is an expression of equality, i.e. women versus men, but rather once you recognize you cannot discriminate, you know, against indigenous women or, you know, or whatever. Um, my reading is, my reading, and this is part of what I, I celebrate very much about what um, the Chilean constitution does is it tells the world, it's about time that something as fundamental to a woman's autonomy and equality as you know, one's reproductive decisions be given sufficient protagonism to deserve its own rights provision so that it doesn't, of course, it's deeply connected with fundamental values of dignity and autonomy and equality, but we don't need to build on those. We now have our own provision. If women had been writing constitutions from day number one, this would have probably been article one in a woman's constitution. Right. So this is how I read the Chilean text to be, you know, what I read it to be doing to say, of course, you know, it's related to all these other values, but we don't finally we don't need to rely on them because we actually have our own provision that recognizes the centrality of these rights, both in terms of autonomy, but but also in terms of services and provision, which is very clearly stated. We don't need, as you were saying, Rebecca, the Nepalese court to come and say, you know, it's it has to be part of the right because it's now written in the text of the constitution that this is not just a, a non-interference a la Roe versus Wade, but rather a provision, positive rights, uh, state obligations. So I, I, I would underscore the autonomy of this right and the sexuality dimension also in terms of what is, you know, groundbreaking. Wonderful. <laughs> uh, Domingo, there, there is one question. I want to give the, the word, uh, the final uh, word to, to Rebecca. I want to hear her before we finish. But, but uh, Rebecca, you said, uh, so Domingo, you said that there was a, a good, a question uh, from uh, from the public. Maybe we can hear it before, and Rebecca, maybe we can can say something about that if if if, if it works. And and also j just to to for for you, Rebecca and Ruth, um, one reaction to this like very progressive um, uh, draft, not only on women's rights but in general, is. Um, is like we are going too far, you know. Uh, this is is out of the path of constitutionalism, um, and 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 even if we we find some uh, connections, especially with a, a new constitution such as the Equatorian Constitution of the Boli um, of the Constitution of Bolivia. Those seems for many people not to be good examples because they are too 
left wing constitutions or, or or they are also went too far so there is a kind of willingness in chile to to be assured that we are uh, we are uh, in the path of the I don't know the mainstream. Uh, uh, um, I don't know uh, constitution from Western world, you know. And and thinking about that, we are thinking about the U.S. or um, imagine or or Europe, you know. Uh, so, U.S. is not mainstream, Veronica. US I know, I know, I know, I know. Are, but yeah, but, yeah, but that absolutely. Okay. But yeah, but I I'm, I'm telling you how the the imaginary here is. So, but but let let's focus on on Europe, for example. So. I, I want. I, I know that that. So so you wrote, for example, you had studied the the uh, the history of gender constitutionalism, and um, maybe I, I want to hear you how this is not a local phenomena of crazy people of crazy feminism, but is is an evolution of 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 mainstream constitutionalism as well. You know. Yeah. I, I I think Veronica that. The first thing you need to do is to really tell the audience that US constitutionalism should not be taken as a point of reference. This is one of the oldest constitutionalist constitutions in the world that was drafted when women didn't even have a right to suffrage. It's one of the few constitutions that doesn't even have an equality clause for women. And, it, and the court that interprets it is now hijacked. So I think that's the main strategy for you to just remove that because if you somehow put that as part of the equation then it shifts it to something that is actually an anomaly thank god to this day now the second thing i would say is that um, in terms of european constitutionalism i think that when you look carefully and i hope that when my book is out hopefully in the next few days finally after having been sitting with the press for a year but um, you will find case law that points in the direction of many of the things that you're saying, right? Now, because um, European constitutions were drafted after the Second World War, which was the heyday of the breadwinner family model, you're not going to find in post-World War II European constitutionalism the kinds of provisions that you find in Latin American new constitutionalism, right? So you do need to go much deeper in, in, in case law. Although you probably read these days that Macron is now, you know, suggesting amending the French constitution to include the right to abortion explicitly. But you're not going to find the most recent you know, in progressive provisions, but you will find case law, you know, so no abortion, you know, is not a right. But if you now take the, 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 the Portuguese abortion decisions, you can see that reproductive autonomy is recognized. And that there's this notion that the community has to take care of, you know, reproduction and not not just, you know, a privacy, leave women alone framing, it just takes it take if you take some of the case law, the Spanish constitutional court, there is some interesting case that uses the protection of the family with the anti discrimination provision to somehow articulate a right to work life balance and so that men can also take paternity leaves, you know, it, you need to do, you know, go into the case law. But I think the most important thing is to reframe and say, why should Latin America be ashamed of leading the world? I mean, what happens is that, you know, the waves of, of democratization have come in times. And of course, later democratizations and deeper democratization processes like the ones in Latin America that have the advantage of, of having more inclusive and participatory forms of constitution making are providing these exemplary provisions um, in, in ways that should be leading the world. And part of it is that they are being written later in time and that they're being written through procedures that are more participatory. So to somehow look back and, and you know, at the mainstream that was man-made constitutionalism seems a mistake. So, you know, I, you know, 
so yes and no yes in in the in that you can find seeds of many of the things that you're doing in evolved european constitutionalism and also you know constitutionalism of other parts of the world uh, rebecca just mentioned nepal which was probably the most progressive abortion decision so far but also the fact that you shouldn't be looking to post-World War II constitutionalism. Women were not granted the right to vote in France after the Second World War. So the history of constitutionalism has been written by men when men were the actors of constitution making. So to look back to all that old constitutionalism and take that as a reference seems uh, fundamentally wrong. So I think, you know, reframing Latin American constitutionalism vis-a-vis -vis old constitutionalism, where I put European and American constitutionalism, I think that's what you need to do. And you can start with Canada, you can start with South Africa, you can start with the 90s. That is when women's constitutionalism actually starts to make it into the realm. So if you wanna compare yourself to anything, start in the 90s, don't start before then. It makes no sense for very good reason. I think you need to work on that narrative a little bit uh, as well as being strategic and pointing to some of that case law, you know, that, that brings the innovation in indirect ways or some examples of constitutional amendment as the parody uh, constitutional amendments in Europe. Uh, you know, you can you can you can take some examples of constitutional amendment, constitutional case law, but also shamelessly defend that the 21st century is the constitution is the century for women's constitutionalism. Not before then, just women were not part of the game. Okay, thank you. I think yeah, you made you made a very convincing uh, uh, point, strong point. Thank you, Ruth. I completely agree with you. I want to hear Rebecca. Uh, I know that you had been taking a lot of uh, of, of notes. Sure. And we have five minutes left. Um, yeah. Just to re just to reinforce what Ruth has said, which I think is so important. Um, I, I want to refer you to Ruth's uh, uh, article in a chapter in a book I edited, Abortion Law and Transnational Perspective, which is uh, available in Spanish, and a chapter that Veronica did in that book on proportionality. Yes, protecting prenatal life is an important social value, but it must be done consistently with women's rights. And what it can be done through better prenatal care, it can be done in a variety of different ways. And we need what is also very significant about Article 61 is it looks at the continuum of care uh, that is necessary that we have healthy birth outcomes. Uh, so this, uh, this uh, effort to exceptionalize Article 61 by looking at late-term abortion, I think is completely misguided. Yes, it's based upon false information and that you need to refer them to the 2022 WHO abortion guidelines. Um, in Canada, we have no criminal law on abortion. We have no limitation on gestational limits. We control that by ensuring that service is available as early as possible in pregnancy. And we have no, no problems with late-term abortion. And it certainly isn't well-regulated by, by law. It's, regulated best by availability of services early in pregnancy. Um, now, in terms of, I, I completely agree with Ruth's point about the provisions, Article 61 on sexuality. And I think what rights we use, what constitutional rights we use to foreground um, what we, whether it's it's, uh, it's whether it's uh, the right to security, the person say in Canada or the right to conscience, it really is context specific. I only mention that as an example of how rights can be captured and can be very gendered. And the right of conscience, it might not resonate in Chile, in Chile and that's fine. There's other rights I'm sure in the constitution, like maybe the right to dignity, the right to, um, uh, uh, integrity, um, but what is very, very significant about the Article 61 framing is, as Ruth said, the, the grounding in uh, non-discrimination. 
uh, which will um, really lead, lead the world in terms of constitution making and in gender universalism. I think that's, uh, those are the only points that I want to end with, except to congratulate you on an absolutely remarkable draft. Uh, uh, and in terms of ensuring that Chile leads the world in constitution making, in gender constitution making, um, whether and how, not only in gender constitution making, but how it will interpret this new constitution. So more power to you. Thank you very much, um, Ruth and Rebecca, for your uh, very insightful uh, views of, uh, of our draft. Uh, I will give you, Domingo, you are the last words here. You were you are one of the hosts, and I didn't uh, give you the, the didn't, didn't give the, you, you the floor because I wanted to hear uh, Rebecca. So so please forget uh, for, uh, forget me. Uh, but um, you have the last words, and thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much, Veronica, uh, Rebecca, and Ruth. Uh, we had a, a question in the in the chat. We are not. We don't have time to 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 answer it. But just wanted to let you know that according to Article uh, three twelve point three, courts, no matter which which kind of procedure uh, are deciding, will have the duty, the constitutional duty, to judge with a gender perspective. And this has also sparked uh, a, a heated debate among the. The, the legal scholars, you know, we, what, the, uh, what gender perspective actually is. Um, but we can have that conversation later in time and hopefully if the constitution is approved uh, at, at a later stage. So thank you so much, Ruth, Rebecca and Veronica. And I think Marta Blackwell from the Canadian Council will uh, close the conversation. Yeah, thank you all so much. Gracias, Domingo. Thank you, Ruth, Veronica, Rebecca. Um, we really appreciate everyone for sticking with us today in throughout our technical challenges, but uh, we appreciate the conversation so much and look forward to continuing it. I don't think that this is this is sort of the beginning series of something that we've started with, uh, with Domingo at Universidad Diego Portales, and it's something that we want to continue doing going forward. So please keep your eyes out for, for any new announcements on, on upcoming events. And you can always find all of our events videos on our website at ccacanada.com. And again, thank you very much, Veronica, for your moderating, uh, Ruth and Rebecca, for all of your insight and uh, expertise on all of these issues. So with that, I'll close the event and everyone have a great day. Thank you. Yes. Goodbye. Thank you. Good luck with that vote. Go Chile. Yeah, vamos. <laughs>